Do you feel like you're living a fairy tale? For all our differences, I think we can all agree on at least one thing. Life is not a fairy tale. But for a lucky few, it does get pretty darn close. Just add one part beautiful commoner, one part dashing prince, a dazzling global love affair, and you're all set. Well, unless you're Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, that is. Then you're screwed. Seeing as I live in Australia and King Frederick X of Denmark has recently ascended the throne alongside his beautiful Australian-born wife, the now newly minted Queen Mary, I thought I'd make a video looking into the differences between Queen Mary and Meghan Markle. Differences which have led one woman to the throne and the other to parking lots. Lots and lots of parking lots. Twenty-eight-year-old Mary Donaldson had a chance encounter at a pub in Sydney called the Slip Inn during the 2000 Olympics, where she unknowingly met her future husband, who just happened to be the Crown Prince of Denmark. The first time that uh, we met, I did not know he was the Crown Prince of Denmark. Perhaps half an hour or so later, that someone came up to me and said, "Do you know who these people are?" And I said, "No." And then we found out. I remember hearing this story before, years before Meghan even met Harry. And I remember thinking as a little girl, wow, you know, it's like a fairy tale. And I never really thought much of it other than how cool it was. But when I heard it again recently, because of the news of their ascension to the throne, I couldn't help but think that it sounded eerily similar to Meghan's version. Because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family and so I didn't know much about him and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was I had one question I said was he nice which brings me to the question does anyone else get the sense that Megan may have borrowed or perhaps I should say plagiarized you know she has a soft spot for plagiarism from this seemingly sincere story of serendipity on the part of Queen Mary and King Frederick or is it just me? Well, let me know in the comments below. From my experiences, the truth doesn't change. You have the one story and you stick with it. And that is absolutely the case with Queen Mary and King Frederick whenever they talk about how they met. With Meghan and Harry, of course, uh, we can't say the same thing. There's a reason I titled my review of the first episode of their Netflix reality show, When Harry Met Meghan version 457, because for the life of them, they can't stick to one story. And that, to me and many others, is the hallmark of a lie. As I did my research and watched a bunch of interviews, including Queen Mary and King Frederick's engagement interview from all the way back in 2003, what really stood out to me is their sincerity much like William and Catherine. I mean, you can see how Mary at the time was quite guarded and measured in her responses obviously because she wasn't used to the limelight, just like Catherine. But she still came across as completely honest, sincere, and very likable. And that is in stark contrast to how I think the entire world collectively felt, whether we like to admit it or not, that there was something off about Meghan when she was introduced to us during her 2017 engagement interview with Harry. I also learned that Mary and Frederick at the time, obviously her being from Australia and him being from Denmark, engaged in a long distance relationship for about two to three years before they were engaged. And unlike Meghan and Harry, they had enough time to really get to know one another. I think it's, it's one of those where we just slowly, a relationship where we just slowly got closer and closer to each other despite the geographical distance. Slowly but surely love as well came into it. Meghan and Harry's romance on the other end was very aptly described as a whirlwind romance. An obvious red flag to everyone but Harry himself, who seemed to delight in the mere notion. Now, thanks to the Netflix docuseries and Harry's book, we know that their courtship was very much indeed a whirlwind romance. I mean, that entire first episode 
of their reality show was a master class in love bombing. I do go into detail about her love bombing tactics in my review of the episode, so I won't be going into it right now, but suffice it to say that she practically changed her entire persona just to lure him in, and he fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Just like Meghan Markle, Mary was a foreigner from a very far away land. And given that I live in Australia, I don't use the word far very lightly. But after two years of long distance courtship, Mary and Frederick officially announced their relationship in 2003 in Copenhagen with a simple kiss. Soon after that, their engagement was officially announced. And by then, Mary was already well and truly on her way to mastering the Danish language, which from what I hear, is not an easy language to learn, especially by someone who wasn't already bilingual. I have read at I tale of in Dansk. Thank for it, but it doesn't work. But Mary was committed to mastering her husband's mother tongue, and with the aid of two teachers, she committed herself to learning the language with a dedication that the likes of Meghan Markle could only dream of attaining. Oh, hvis jeg snakker med nogen fra Danmark, tale jeg så fuld i dansk. Ja, det er klart. <laughs> we read the newspapers, we read historical books, we read about the royal family, we watch uh, things that are important in, in Denmark's history, for example, the TV series Matador. And all of her hard work didn't go unnoticed. Not just by the Danish people, who have embraced her fully and seem to absolutely adore her, but also by her royal in-laws. As we have come to know Mary, we, her parents-in-law, have come to love and admire her. She has great inner strength, and she exudes a calm warmth that inspires confidence. She has shown the courage to place her future life in Denmark. May we always be worthy of her trust. And I do have to say, in her eagerness to learn the Danish language, her Australian accent was affected. As I listened to it, despite not having one myself, I'm very attuned, obviously, to listening to it. And she sounds like a Danish woman who maybe lived in Australia for a few years and picked up, you know, her English was based on the Australian accent, rather than an Australian woman who then moved to Denmark. That's how far she went in mastering the language. I mean, even her father comments on this. I think there's no doubt that she has taken on uh, Danish ears. Uh, she does have a, a slight Danish touch in her voice, in her accent. Like Princess Catherine, what really stood out to me was just how much respect Mary afforded to her new country, her new family, and the monarchy itself. Unlike a certain someone who has practically made a career of mocking and tarnishing and attempting to destroy her new family, her royal in-laws, and the country that so willingly and happily and lovingly accepted her. I mean, where do I start? Her complaints about having to Google and learn the UK national anthem, which is in English, or her mockery of her husband's family and their traditions when she put on this disgraceful display of the moment that she met the queen. Pleasure to meet you, your majesty. Or perhaps it's her moaning and complaining on her podcast about how difficult the UK citizenship test was. And listen to what her guest had to say in response to that. Her guest, who was an American citizen who passed the UK citizenship test very recently at the time. That citizenship exam is so hard. I was studying for it. And I remember going, oh, my goodness, I would ask my husband, did you know this? Did you know this? And people went, oh, I had no idea. I think they made it harder for you. Ouch. Oh, and let's not forget the complete and utter lack of respect they showed the queen when they decided to name their daughter Lilibet without seeking the queen's permission. Now, this is old news that has been gathering a lot of speed these past few days because of a book that is going to be published very soon. And in this book, the author detailed how the queen was allegedly livid 
over not just the fact that they named their daughter Lilibet, which is the queen's private nickname, but also the fact that they lied so blatantly about her giving them permission, going as far as threatening to sue certain publications like the BBC for defamation when they rightly reported that no permission was sought. And how, you ask, do you know that this was a lie and the BBC was right in the reporting? Well, by the simple fact that Meghan and Harry never proceeded to sue. They just dropped it because it was nothing more than yet another empty threat. Talk about disrespecting the monarch and your grandmother and grandmother-in-law. I mean, doesn't she start waving around like a crazy person on her Netflix show? I love grandmas. For someone who loves grandmas, you have a very odd way of showing it. <laughs> I mean, this woman was in her final years and this is how they chose to treat her. What a disgrace. There's another issue that really distinguishes the two of them, and that is the issue of family. For starters, Mary's husband actually met her family. I'm presuming he asked her father for her hand. It, it's so nice to see how relaxed he is around them. My nieces and nephews love him. Um, my family think he's, he is a wonderful person, uh, which he is. Now, I'm not talking about unhealthy, toxic, abusive families. Of course they exist and it's heartbreaking, but that's not the family, thankfully for Mary, that she came from. And we know because of Megan herself and her TIG blog and her Instagram posts and her UN speech and her countless interviews before meeting Harry, that her family didn't fall under that umbrella either. In fact, she adored her father and sang his praises until it suited her not to. And I think when it comes to red flags, despite the engagement interview being a major red flag in itself, the biggest one for me personally was as I sat there watching her wedding in 2018 and seeing how, apart from her mother, she had no family. And 200 strangers practically, apart from a few colleagues and acquaintances. And you could say, oh, maybe she had a falling out with her father's side. No, apart from her mother, there was no one from her maternal side either. And when you have that many people that you're not talking to and you're the one common denominator, flags are raised, alarm bells are sounded, questions are asked. Has it sunk in yet that you will be the next queen of Denmark? Uh, not completely, no. Which brings us to the ascension. Now, I would say coronation, but they didn't have one because the Danes are known to be very low key when it comes to their monarchy, especially in comparison to the Brits who were, you know, all about the pomp and ceremony, which I love. But the Danish monarchy chose to make it quite a simple low key affair. So on New Year's Eve, Queen Margareta, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, that's how I've heard people say it online, officially announced her abdication during her New Year's Eve speech to her subjects. And while it was taken by surprise, because I believe she had stated that she wouldn't be abdicating not too long ago, people otherwise were quite happy with the news. They welcomed it. King Frederick seems to be very well loved, which was quite obvious when on the 14th of January, only a couple of days ago, he emerged onto the balcony along with his beautiful, loyal Queen Mary to thunderous rounds of applause and cheering from their loyal and loving subjects. So it appears that despite rumors of the affair, which are also quite recent, Frederick is very popular with the people. He always has been. Even before Mary, he was the playboy prince, turbo prince, as they called him, going from supermodel to supermodel until Mary tamed him, as one interviewer said. So has the girl from Tasmania tamed the turbo prince? <laughs> in, a, in a certain way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> or did she? Because, you know, the allegations, as I said, have not exactly been shut down. Now, I'm not going to be talking about them because I wanted this video to purely focus on Queen Mary and just what an asset, what a gift she is from Australia 
to Denmark and I'm sure the Danish people will agree but if you do want to know more about the affair I would recommend the Royal News Network channel headed by Brittany she has a video on there that she made recently covering the issue quite succinctly in my opinion so head on over to her channel if you want to know more the only reason I've brought it up is because some people are saying that that's the reason the Queen abdicated to kind of overshadow those rumors and distract people, I suppose, by making her son king. I don't know much about the Danish royal family. I don't know how much credence to give that train of thought. And I obviously don't know whether there was even an affair, whether these allegations are even substantial. I will say that I would have thought that matters like an abdication wouldn't be undertaken on a whim and they would presumably involve some time to plan and put things into place because it's not just a simple matter of signing a paper. You know, there's obviously some behind the scenes planning and sorting out that needs to be done. So way I see it, I don't know. It doesn't seem logical, but it's still possible. Let me know what you think in the comments. Regardless of the king's actions and what he may and may not have done, Queen Mary is obviously an asset, as I said, to Denmark and the Danish people. And it is so lovely to see how the Danes absolutely embraced her so lovingly, as the Brits did with Meghan, from the very beginning. She has so many parallels with Catherine. They are just such beautiful, elegant, classy, almost born to be royal women, despite the fact that they were both commoners. I mean, honestly, I'm gonna give you guys some insight into my thinking. I don't even really buy into all this royalty stuff. I see these people as human beings. Even when I defend the British royal family, I defend them on the basis that they're being wronged, as far as I can see, by Meghan and Harry, rather than, oh, they're royalty, because I just see us as people. I see us as humans. And I see Catherine as a very decent human being. And I see Queen Mary now as a very decent human being. So for me to say that they were born to be royalty, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is they do have a regal quality to them, whether they were going to be royals or not. For years now, 20 years in Queen Mary's case, she hasn't set one foot wrong. And that's saying something with the eyes of the world trained on you, with all the cameras to capture every awkward moment, she still managed to emerge relatively unscathed. And it took Megan all of a few minutes into her engagement interview to slip up and show us her true colors. Was he nice? Now that's talent for you. And that's it. I just wanted this video to be a commentary on how you reap what you sow. Queen Mary got what she deserves and as did Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. Let me know what you think, as usual, and uh, I suppose I'll see you in the next one. Take care and bye-bye.